Now, I know I've shared this story uh, 99 times before, but you know, 99 is kind of an odd number, so why not 100? Um, and so, you know, I've told you before about the time that the devil showed up at church, right? And, and as the devil came in, you know, it was, everyone was just scrambling. It was just sheer pandemonium as everybody was running to, to get away. That is, except everybody except for one little old guy who just sat in his seat. And so the devil came up to him and he said, don't you know who I am? And the guy says, yep, I know who you are. And, and the devil looks at him and says, well, well, aren't you afraid of me? He says, nope, I'm not afraid of you. He says, don't you, don't you know how powerful I am? And the guy says, yep, I know how powerful you are. And the devil says, well, well, then, you know, I mean, don't you know what I could do to you? He says, yep, I know exactly what you could do to me. Well, then why aren't you afraid of me? And the guy looks at him and says, listen, I'm not afraid of you because, because I've been married to your sister for the last 48 years. <laughs> it's an oldie but a goodie. Now, the reason I share this, this lame story with you for the 100th time is because uh, the, the title of our message this morning as we, as we continue in Luke chapter 13 is, When the Devil's in Church. When the Devil's in Church. Now, listen, this might surprise you, but there are times when the devil is actually in church. Now, having said that, let's keep this in mind. Keep in mind that the Bible tells us that Jesus came to, to, to set the captive free. Jesus came to set the captive free, and that's what we're going to see this morning in, in this passage before us, as we see that Jesus came to set those free who, who had been bound by the devil. And so in this passage before us, we see this woman who, who, who had been set free from the hold that the devil had on her life, but at the same time, we also see an entire congregation uh, uh, set free from the force that had bound them, that had put them in bondage. And so now with that, as we pick it back up in verses 10 through 13, first of all, we, we see this woman in bondage. Th this woman in bondage who, who gets set free. So it says again in verse 10, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years, and she was bent over, and she could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he, he, he called to her. He called her to him, and he said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now, this is a great story. But what's interesting is, is that Luke is the only of the Gospels that has this story. Now, you remember, there, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but, but Luke is the only one who actually includes uh, this incident in his Gospel account. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I think that it was because he, he was a medical doctor. And, and, and no doubt, as a medical physician, I mean, this, this story must have grabbed his attention. I mean, the, the, the chronic condition that this woman was in, and yet the dramatic way that, that she was healed and set free. I mean, it caught his attention, so he wrote it down. But then number two, I think he wrote it down because of the key verse of the Gospel of Luke. Now, for those of you that are, that are Bible students, I know that you always love looking for the, the key verse, that, that one verse in each book of the Bible that, that's almost like the, like the purpose statement for the book, the, the, the mission statement for the book, that, that one verse that tells you what that whole book of the Bible is all about. And as we've said before, the, the key verse for, for the Gospel of Luke was Luke chapter 19, verse 10, which says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so because of that, Luke uh, put, puts a special, a special emphasis on the lost in his gospel, a special emphasis on the, on the outcast and, and the sinner. And so with that, he has certain stories in his gospel accounts that the other gospel writers don't. Uh, for example, Luke is the only one that tells us the story of the, of the Good Samaritan. Luke's the only one that tells us the story of, uh, of the Pharisee and the tax collector who went up to the temple to pray. And likewise, Luke is the only one who tells us about the thief on the cross next to Jesus. And, and in his last dying breath, he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And then it's only in Luke's gospel that we, that we read the three parables of the lost. There's the parable of the lost son, sometimes called the prodigal son. Then there's the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost sheep. And so now in keeping with that, only in Luke's gospel do we find this account of this woman who, who verse uh, 11 says, was bent over so that she could in no way raise herself up. Now, th this shouldn't surprise us, but in the original language, Luke is using a medical term here. 
Of course, that doesn't surprise us because he, he was a physician. He, he was a doctor. And so he uses this, this ancient medical term uh, that, that describes a, a severe curvature of the spine, so severe that, that it caused her whole body to be completely doubled over, permanently doubled over. Now, of course, today we, we would call this scoliosis. Yeah, but, but this wasn't a mild form or even a moderate form of scoliosis. This was, this was a chronic, this was a severe form of scoliosis. Uh, in fact, uh, some of you may be surprised to hear that, that the fastest man on the planet right now, the fastest man on earth, Usain Bolt, has scoliosis, a, a curvature of the spine. In fact, it's been speculated that that might be one of the reasons that he's so fast, that there's something about the curvature of his spine that, that actually, in some ways, is kind of like a hidden blessing. It, it, it actually helps him to run faster. And then also Douglas MacArthur, the famous uh, five-star general from World War II, he had scoliosis. And so these are just a couple of, of examples of men who, among the other things that they had to overcome, that they had to overcome debilitating, chronic pain caused by this spinal deformity to, to reach greatness. Well, in the passage before us, we now meet this woman who's, who's been doubled over for 18 years. For 18 years, she's, she's had to overcome chronic pain just to get to church, or in this case, to, to synagogue services. I mean, for 18 years, uh, you know, she, she's had to overcome this pain. Now, you would have thought after 18 years of, of pain, 18 years of, of mockery, 18 years of, of being looked at as, as some kind of freak show, uh, circus act, you would have thought after 18 years of praying to be healed and, and 18 years of begging God to, 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 to help her, you would have thought that by now she, she, she would have given up on God. She would have given up on church. And yet the text seems to imply that, that she's been coming to the synagogue week after week, every week, year after year, for 18 years. For 18 years. And yet, the author, Luke, Dr. Luke, tells us that, that her condition was not a medical condition. Her condition was not a physical condition, but rather, Dr. Luke tells us that her condition was a spiritual condition. A spiritual condition, because again, in verse 11, it says, Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. There's a couple of things that are important to notice here. Now, number one, it's important to notice, it, it does not say that she was demon-possessed. I mean, in the Bible, whenever somebody's demon-possessed, the Bible tells us they were demon-possessed. It doesn't say that she was demon-possessed, and and. And not only that, but, but literally from the original language, this could literally be translated that there was a woman who had been crippled or bent over by an evil spirit. And so this was not a demonic spirit that possessed her, that, that, that lived inside of her, but rather this was a, a demonic spirit that was afflicting her and tormenting her physically from the outside. Afflicting her from the outside, bending her over. And something else is, unlike all those other cases where there were demon-possessed people and Jesus delivered them, uh, in, in this particular case, we, we don't see that, that Jesus addresses the demon like he does in some of those other cases. He doesn't talk to it, doesn't ask it its name. Uh, there, there, there's, he doesn't give it any commands. And not only that, but, but uh, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, cast the demon out of this woman. It just simply says that he, he, he loosed her. He set her free. He says, woman, you are loose. He, he laid hands on her and set her free. So evidently, uh, this, this seems to imply that, that there are some illnesses, there, there are some diseases, there are some physical things that happen that might actually be a demonic attack, that might actually be a demonic attack. And so this is one example. Another example would be out of Job chapter 2. Remember that time where, where, where Job all of a sudden breaks out with, with painful boils and, and painful sores all over his body, and, and apparently it lasted for several months. And yet uh, it seems, as you read the text, that, that it was actually inflicted by the devil himself. We know this because right before it happened, you know, Satan and God are having a conversation. And, and Satan, you know, it, it's like he, 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 he tries to bet God. He's like, hey, God, you know what? I'll bet bet you anything, I'll bet you if, if you strike Job with, if you allow me to strike Job with pain, if you allow me to strike Job with suffering, if you allow me to strike Job with, with, with disease, I'll bet you anything, he'll deny you right on the spot. 
And all of a sudden, God answers, and, and he's like, you know what? I'll take that bet. Because he knew Job's heart. And he, and he knew that no matter what Job went through, no matter what he faced, in the end, Job would be faithful to God. He wouldn't deny his God. I don't know about you, but if Satan and God are having that conversation, hey, don't bet. About, if they're having that about me, don't place any bets. <laughs> God knew Job's heart. And now in the same way, for reasons we may never know, uh, we, we read about this woman here in Luke chapter 13 who, who's afflicted and, and, and tormented by this demonic spirit who had bent her over for 18 years. Now, does, does this mean that, that all sickness, that all disease, that, that all chronic pain and suffering is, is, is demonic? Demonic attack? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, you, you, all disease, I mean, you start to feel a little cold on, get a little sniffling, like, oh, no, I think the devil's attacking me. Does it mean that all sickness is, is demonic attack? Answer, no. Uh, because, uh, listen, not only d does Satan bow people down, as we see here in Luke chapter 13, not only does Satan bow people down, but we also know that sin can bow people down. For example, in, in Psalm 38, in a context that's dealing with David's sin, a time when, when David was, was facing the consequences of his sin, in Psalm 38, verse 6, David cries out and says, I'm troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. And so, yes, Satan can bow people down, but so can our own sin bow us down. Not only can Satan and not only can sin bow us down, but so can sorrow and, and depression. Again, at a time in David's life facing chronic uh, depression, he cries out in Psalm 42, verse 5, and says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Some translations, why are you bowed down, O my soul? And so the devil can bow us down. Sin can bow us down. Uh, depression can bow us down. But you know what? So can physical pain. So can physical suffering. In fact, at a time in, in the life of the, of the nation of Israel, when the whole nation was in chronic pain, the nation cries out in Psalm 44, verse 25, and, and they say, For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. And so, you know, we need to understand that as believers, there, there are a variety of things that can come against us. There are a variety of things that can influence. Yes, uh, Satan can attack us. Satan can bow us down. But you know what? Uh, there's, there, not only do we wrestle against the devil, but we also wrestle against our own flesh and also against the forces of this world. There are a lot of things that can come against us. You see, and I bring this up because I think we need to be careful whenever we read a passage like this and, 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 and be careful because, you know, sometimes we can read a passage like this and, and be tempted to think that there's a demonic force behind everything out there. You know, there's a demon here and a demon there and a demon everywhere. You know, we could read a passage like this and, you know, and walk away and be like, you know what? I bind you, spirit of lust. I bind you, spirit of adultery. I bind you, spirit of, 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 of anger. You know, we get a little sweet tooth going on and we're all, you know, you know I bind you, spirit of cold stone creamery. <laughs> and so we need to be balanced. But speaking of balance, at the same time, notice the author, Luke, Dr. Luke, physician Luke, doesn't flippantly write off, he doesn't flippantly ignore the, the spiritual component of this. He doesn't flippantly ignore the demonic component of her condition. In fact, if anything, uh, he, that's his diagnosis. As a doctor, that's his diagnosis. He says in verse 11, Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And so as a medical physician, as a medical professional, this was his diagnosis. And, and, and so now as a medical professional, he realized that, that her condition was way beyond his pay grade. And so he refers her to a specialist. He refers her to, to the great physician, namely to Jesus Christ. And now in verse 12, Jesus looks at her and says, woman, you are loosed. But notice, Jesus doesn't say you were healed. Jesus doesn't say you're medically cleared. Jesus doesn't say, uh, you, you know, that, that you're in remission. He doesn't use medical terms. He uses a spiritual term. He says, you are loosed. Some translations set free. The, the original word, aplu, that's used here, literally uh, is better translated released. It speaks of a prisoner that, that's, that's been released from their captivity. 
And so just as, as some prisoners are locked in dungeons and just as others are, are shackled in chains, this woman had been bound by some demonic force that had held her in a, in a prison of chronic pain that had doubled her over for 18 years. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ has set her free. Why? Because this is what the Bible says he came to do. He came to set the captives free. Now, as we pick it up in verse 14, it's, it's as if now we, we see that there's an entire congregation that was in bondage. Now that this woman's been set free, there's an entire congregation that was in bondage. Verse 14, but the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, in other words, to the congregation, he said to the crowd, to the congregation, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Now, who is this guy? Well, it says he was the ruler of the synagogue. Now, what we need to know about that was that, first of all, he was not paid staff. He was not like on full-time staff at the synagogue. Rather, he, he was a volunteer. He, he was like a, like a volunteer leader, like, like, a, like a lay leader. But now as the ruler of the synagogue, it was his job description. He was the one who, who had to plan the, the order of the synagogue service. And so it was his job to, to, to plan, you know, the scripture reading. You know, which scripture would be read by that day and who would read it and when they would stand and read it. He would plan the songs, you know, what song they were going to sing and, and in what order were they going to sing those songs. He'd plan, you know, when you're going to light the candles and, and this and that. So he would come up with the itinerary. He would come up with the schedule, and it was his job to keep everything running right on schedule, to keep it running right on schedule. But when, when this woman who, who's, who's in bondage to this demonic spirit that's doubled over for, for 18 years, I mean, obviously he knew this woman. She'd been coming to his synagogue for 18 years. And when this woman is, is all of a sudden set free, well, rather than rejoice, rather than get excited, he gets indignant, you know, and, and, and he gets bothered, you know, and, and he's like, you know, I mean, you know, this, this isn't on the schedule. This isn't on my list. He's like, you know what, I mean, you know, if, if, if you're going to start healing people and stuff, you know, if you're going to start, you know, setting people free and stuff, you really need to check with me first. You know, I'm in charge around here. You need, you need to run things by me. So, you know, this is, you know, a guy that's basically a control freak. He's got his hands on everything. And so in, in many ways, while this woman had been bound by this evil spirit for 18 years, in the same way, it's as if this congregation was under the bondage of this heavy-handed ruler of the synagogue. Years back, I heard Pastor Skip Heidzik, the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Albuquerque, say at a pastor's conference he, that, that he's seen some churches that are deacon-possessed. <laughs> and, and that's a good description here. You, you've got this, this, this lay leader who, who's, who's in charge, and he's in control, and he's got his hands on everything. You see, and I share this because, you know, there are times when the devil shows up at church. You see, there are times when the devil shows up at church, and, and sometimes it happens when, when broken people show up at a church. When a broken person comes in and a person who, who's been afflicted by the devil, they're in bondage to certain things and, and the devil's been oppressing them and, and yet they, they stumble into a church service like this and they hear the gospel. And while they're hearing the gospel, Jesus starts working on their heart. Things start happening and then all of a sudden the devil shows up and he starts to whisper in their ear. I mean, he starts to lie to them. He starts to say things to them like, you know what? You, you don't belong here with these good people. You don't belong here with these holy, righteous people. I mean, look at you. Look at the way you live. I mean, especially after what you did last night, you don't belong here. Or then again, maybe he whispers and says, you know what? All these people, they're judging you. They're judgmental. They're, they're pointing the finger at you. They're talking about you. But then again, sometimes the devil shows up at other times. Another way the devil shows up is after people get saved, after people have been set free, after the Lord does a work in somebody's life, and then all of a sudden the devil comes in, shows up, and tries to cause division in that church, infighting in that church. Maybe he tries to cause the, the old guard to, to get offended by all this new work, kind of like what's happening here with this ruler of the synagogue. You see, 
We need to be aware of this. We need to realize that, that if the Lord's going to move and if the Lord's going to set people free, sometimes the devil wants to show up in the process because check it out, the devil's just not going to sit there while you set his captives free. And so sometimes he shows up and we need to be aware of this. And so now, in verse 15, Jesus now answers his critic. Verse 15, And the Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, <laughs> not a compliment, Hypocrite, uh, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and, and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, I mean, think of it, for 18 years, shouldn't she be loosed from the bond, uh, from this bond on the Sabbath? Now, the, the, the first thing I want you to notice is, is how verse 15 starts. Notice verse 15 starts by saying, the Lord then answered him. Now, this is pivotal. This is very important to get a hold of. Hang on to it, because we're going to come right back to it, but this is very important. But first, uh, keep in mind that, that the the, the Jewish religious leaders in those days, like this ruler of the synagogue, you know, they, they had a number of things that they would consider Scripture. Uh, obviously, they had the Scripture, the, the, the Word of God, the Old Testament, that is. Now, it was the Word of God that was inspired by God, spoke by God Himself, and then written down. So they had the, the Bible, but in addition to that, then they had a bunch of other books that were not the Bible, that were not written by God. They, they were not God's Word, they were man's Word. Among those books would be uh, things like the, the Jewish Mishnah and the Jewish Talmud, for example. For example, the, the Jewish Talmud, uh, in, in, in there, there are 24 chapters, 24 chapters of what you can do and cannot do on the Sabbath. 24 chapters of what you can and cannot do. For example, let me read all 24 chapters. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, we're going to be here till 530. Uh for example, according to, to their law, you, you could not heal on the Sabbath. That is, you could not render medical aid, render medical attention on the Sabbath unless the person in question was, was, was facing a life or death situation. So if their life is on the line, then you could intervene, but, but not otherwise. And so obviously in this situation, as far as this guy was concerned, I mean, this woman had been in this situation, had been in this condition for 18 years. It wasn't like one more day was going to kill her. So he's like, leave her alone. Now, also according to, to their law, according to the Talmud, uh, on the Sabbath, you were not allowed to walk more than 500 yards on the Sabbath. Now, however, j just to show you their hypocrisy, just to so show you their duplicity, they had such a high value and, 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 and care for their animals, for, for their cattle and for their livestock, that, that, that they would allow you to have an exception. You know, if you're going to lead your cattle to, to get water, well, then they said, you know what? You could walk twice as far. You could walk a thousand yards on the Sabbath. And that's what Jesus is referring to here when he says, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? He's saying, you know what? You hypocrites. I mean, you, you value animal life so much more than you value human life. You know, it's the same thing today, isn't it? I mean, haven't you been driving somewhere? I don't know, maybe Boulder? Uh, you know, and as you're driving, there's this car in front of you as you're driving in Boulder. You know, it's got all these bumper stickers on it, you know. And, and you know, and on the one side, it's got all these bumper stickers like save the whales and save the trees and save the bumblebees. But then over on the other side, it's like abort the fetus. Or just like Hillary had said this past week uh, when she said that, that, you know, a baby that's even about to be born on the verge of being born still has no rights. And so he's pointing out the hypocrisy, the duplicity of, you know, you value one form of life way more than you value another. He says, you hypocrites. <laughs> now listen, it's one thing when your pastor calls you a hypocrite. But, but look, at, how did verse 15 start? It says, and the Lord said to him. Hey, when, when the Lord calls you a hypocrite, it's time to start checking yourself. And the Lord said to him. You see, this just reminds us that, that this guy had no idea whom he was really dealing with. He had no idea who he was really talking to. He had no idea that Jesus was the Lord, that Jesus was God wrapped up in human flesh. And the reason I bring that up is because of this. 
Because the Bible says in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath wasn't made for God. The Sabbath was made for man. And so check it out. Yeah, those, those Sabbath laws might restrict the work of man, but you know what? It's not going to restrict the work of God. And so, yeah, you could tell a man not to heal on the Sabbath. You can tell a man not to render medical attention on the Sabbath. But you can't tell God when he's going to heal, who he's going to heal, and how he's going to heal. Check it out. He's God. You're not. Deal with it. And so Jesus answers his critic. And as we pick it up in this last verse, verse 17, we're reminded that, that he came to seek and to save the lost. He came to set the captives free. To set the captives free. And so in verse 17, and when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitudes rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. And so in this passage, we see that, that on the one hand, we have this woman who, who had been bound by this demonic spirit that not only made her ill, not only, uh, you know, uh, made her, her, her in chronic pain, but literally held her as his captive for 18 years. And then Jesus Christ set her free. Why? Because that's what he came to do. He came to set the captives free. But not only that, but we also see an entire congregation that apparently was, was under the bondage of this heavy-handed, iron-fisted ruler of the synagogue. This guy who, who held everyone else under his control. And now, it says that they rejoiced. It says that, that his adversaries were put to shame and that the multitudes, that is, the congregation, rejoiced. Why did they rejoice? It says they rejoiced uh, because of all the glorious things that were done by him. Notice, it doesn't say the glorious thing that was done by him. But the glorious things. It's not just that they rejoiced that this woman had been set free, but they rejoiced in the glorious things that had been done by him. And I think among those things, it's just my opinion, but I think among those things is that they had been set free. His adversaries had been put to shame. And when that happened, they were freed. And they rejoiced. In fact, it's interesting, speaking of his, his adversary, the ruler. Do you remember how the ruler of the synagogue first responded when this woman was set free? Look back at verse 14. It says, but the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. He did, not, not with celebration. There's no fist bump. He wasn't like, hey, yeah, who wants to party? Give me one of these. No, with, with indignation. In fact, in the original, the word that's used here, agnocteo, uh, this is a word that can be translated to be angry. This is a word that can be translated to, to be incensed or to be offended. To be offended. I mean, this guy was actually offended by the work of God. This guy was offended by, by, by what the Lord had done in this person's life. He was offended that she had been set free. I mean, when, when, when his precious schedule, when his routine, when, when, when the order that he had established uh, had been disrupted, it offended him. He was incensed. He was angered. He, he's indignant. You know, and that happens. In fact, I'm reminded of the early days of, of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And, and, and back in the 60s, when they first built their very first building, and, and afterwards, the carpet installer had told Pastor Chuck Smith, he said, you know what, this is very expensive shag carpet. And it was the 60s. He said, and the worst thing uh, in the world for it is, is bare feet. He says, because there's oils in the feet that will mingle with dirt, making cleaning of it nearly impossible. Well, now there was, uh, you know, the problem, of course, was that during this time, God was bringing in all these hippies into the church, all these young people in the church who were barefooted. And there was one woman there in particular who had a problem with it. And so she said, you know what? At the old building, it was okay for these kids to come in wearing dirty jeans and bare feet because all we had there were, were plain wooden pews and hardwood floors. But now our pews are, are, are upholstered, and we have this beautiful shag carpet. Beautiful? I bet you had lovely avocado green appliances, too. <laughs> we, we have this beautiful shag carpet, she says. And then she says, I think we should put a box in the back of the church with, with rubber sandals in it and let the kids put them on when they come into church. What that one man, 
kind of a self-appointed leader, took it upon himself to, to, to make a sign. And then he hung it up at church, and it was a sign that said, no bare feet allowed in church. Well, when Pastor Chuck Smith came in, he saw the sign, and, and he took it down immediately. And, and he told every one of them that they needed to check their heart. They needed to check their motives. And then he said, quote, he says, I, I know that there's some, some uptightness about the dirty jeans and the bare feet. In fact, I'm even told that some of the kids put their bare feet up on the hymnal racks and even put their little toes through the communion cup holders. <laughs> but then Chuck says, but if, if, if our plush carpeting that we have is going to cause us to close the door to even one young person who has bare feet, well, then I personally vote in favor of ripping out all the carpeting and having bare concrete floors. <laughs> you see, this just reminds us that, that church life can get messy. Church life can get messy sometimes because check it out. Sometimes in our church come people who are in bondage. Sometimes people will come into our church and they come in through our doors and, and they're in bondage to something. They're in bondage to drugs or in bondage to alcohol, in bondage to prostitution or to, to, to gang activity or, or sometimes just in bondage to intellectualism. I think one of the greatest signs of bondage in our day is, is intellectualism. Too smart to listen to anything else. But they come in and, and they're in bondage to something. Maybe like this woman in the story, they're, they're in bondage to, to, to some you know, disease or some, some chronic pain. But listen, they come in and the Lord brings them in. Why? Because he wants to set them free. He, he wants to set them free. Now listen, some of us, when we hear that, we hear that the Lord wants to set people free. I mean, we get psyched. We get pumped up. We're like, yeah, let's chest bump. I mean, we, we get excited about it. But in the same way, Unfortunately, whenever captives are being set free, not everyone gets excited about it. Not everyone is, is happy about it because sometimes the old guard, quite frankly, would prefer to see them stay in their captivity rather than to see their, their routine, rather than to see that the, the order that they've established get disturbed because change is threatening. Change is, is uncomfortable. I mean, it's risky when these people come in. I mean, what's going to happen? Hey, listen, it's been well said that the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And that's true. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, that, that those who are well have no need of a physician. It's those who are sick. And in the same way, I did not, call, I did not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. I mean, listen, I am so thankful for that church that I walked into back in 1985 when I was 15 years old, when I was a 15-year-old hopeless runaway. And I came into that church. And when I came into that church, I was a lot like the, the woman in the story. Now, listen, I'm not saying I'm a woman. <laughs> I'm saying I was a lot like this woman. And, and that just like her, I was in bondage too. I was in bondage to, to self-worthlessness in bondage to, to suicide, in bondage to pornography, in bondage to in insecurity, and all kinds of other things. And when I came to that church, I mean, every time I'd come, it was, like the, it was like the preacher was up there talking about me. And so one night at a midweek service, the preacher's up there, and, and as he's preaching, again, it's one of those sermons where it feels like he's talking about me. And then all of a sudden, he says, you know what? I just had a vision as I was preaching of a, of a teenager in this room. And the whole service, God's been talking to you, and he's been touching your heart. And I'm like, see, he was talking about me. He says, you know what, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to take a stand for Jesus Christ in this room. He says, because you know what, if you cannot stand for Jesus Christ in a room filled with people who already love Jesus Christ, then you'll never stand for Jesus out there filled with a world full of people who hate Jesus Christ. And then he went on to quote a passage out of Jude, chapter 1. Well, really, there's only one chapter in Jude. So Jude, verse 23, he, he quotes this, this verse where, where it says that, that God saw you as if you were a branch in the fire. This branch that was being destroyed and you were being burned and yet God had compassion on you and he loved you. And so he risked life and limb and he, and he reached into the fire himself and he pulled you out. He saved you as though through fire. And as the preacher was sharing that, I mean, literally, I, I'm not making this up. I felt like I was burning up. I mean, I felt really hot. And, 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 and all of a sudden I thought, you know what? There is no way I'm going to stand up in front of all these people. There are 2,000 people in that room. But I'm not going to stand up in front of these people and make a fool out of myself. And so I grabbed my chair as hard as I could. Now, it was a folding chair. That was my first mistake. But I grabbed that thing as hard as I could. And yet, literally, as, as, as he was quoting this passage about this, about this branch that had been rescued by the flame, 
and saying, you know, that's God rescuing you from the fire. And I felt like I was on fire. Literally, in that moment, it felt like somebody's hand was literally on my head, lifting me up out of my seat. And the next thing I know, I'm standing up with my chair still stuck to my butt. <laughs> and I was terrified. And, and I was terrified, frankly, of all these church people. I was terrified of, of, of all these, quote-unquote, holy people, all these righteous people, all these, all these do-gooders. I was terrified that they were going to judge me, that they would judge me. And yet in that moment, instead, when, when I stood up for Christ in that moment, when I stood up for Jesus, instead of judging me, they clapped and they cheered for me. And as far as I can remember, that was the first time in my life anyone had ever cheered for me. I mean, listen, my, my whole life, I, I never had a, a teacher. I never had a parent. I never had a coach in my corner cheering for me. But in that moment, standing for Jesus, there were 2,000. And I'm here to tell you in the same way that, that, that if you're here and if you're broken, if, if you're here and you're in bondage, something's got a hold on you, I'm here to tell you that if you take a stand for Jesus Christ, we're not here to judge you. We're in your corner. We're here to cheer you on because we've been there. We know what it's like. We were prisoners too, and we know what it's like to be in captivity, but now we've been set free, and we know the joy of the other side. And so we're in your corner. We're cheering for you. So I'm here to tell you that if you stand for Jesus Christ, it'll be the best decision you've ever made in your life. It'll change your life. And in the same way this evening, we're going to come back at 530 and talk about this outreach. And how, how God might want to use us as this church and this community to reach the lost, to change people's lives. But we need to be ready. Because, because if people are going to be set free, sometimes the devil shows up. He doesn't stand still when you set his captives free. And so we need to be ready for that. Am I right? So Lord, we thank you for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you that you're not some kind of a cop in the sky waiting to bust us. And Lord, nor are we as Christians supposed to be little narcs running around narking on all the people and, 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 and ratting them out and tell, telling you what they're doing. Lord, we just pray for them and we love them and we're glad that they're here. Because your word tells us that you love them, that you so love them, that you came in their place. You died for them as their substitute. And I'm here to tell you that if you stand for Jesus Christ, he'll change your life. But if you can't stand for Jesus in a room filled with people who already love Jesus, you'll never have the guts to do it out there. And so let me ask you, is, is this you? Are, are you broken? Are you in bondage to something? And you've tried to get out. You've tried and you've tried. And, 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 you're, and, you know, and, you're, and you're looking for something in your life. And, and, and sometimes you feel better about yourself, but it always comes back. It's like, it's like you're, you're a dog chasing its tail. There's just no way out. Do you want to be free? Do you want to be free? So I'm going to ask you to be bold. It scared the heck out of me when I was 15 years old, but I'm here to tell you it's the best thing I've ever done. I'm going to ask you to be bold. Jesus said, if you stand before men, and confess me, I'll stand before heaven and confess you. In other words, he's saying, if you're ashamed of me and you won't confess me, then sorry, I, I'm not going to claim you either. But if you've got the guts to, to love me, then I'm going to love you back. In fact, the Bible says he actually first loved you. So it's your turn to love him back. Are, are you going to receive him? So if this is you, listen, do you want to be free? If so, right where you are, just, just stand. And by standing, saying, you know what? I'm confessing you. I need you. Just be bold and stand if that's you. We'll pray for you. Although I'm not totally convinced, maybe this means one of two things. Either, Lord, we've, we've all stood for you and we've confessed you and we're living for you. Or maybe there's others in here that, that need to stand. Maybe, maybe you, you're, you're a, you called yourself a Christian, but you've, you've walked away. You've, you've gone back to the old scene. You need to stand back up. Does anyone else? As you're standing before him, he, he's loving on you. There's no condemnation here. Father, we thank you for those that are standing in this room or in the overflow or online watching. Maybe they're standing right in front of their webcam. But Lord, they're really standing before you, saying, Lord, have mercy on me. 
forgive me. If you were, if you were a Christian who, who's fallen away, then you already know his love and you know his, his, his mercy. But he loves you and he has mercy on you. I'm going to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would, have, you would have compassion, that your mercy would flow, that your forgiveness would flow. If you're standing, pray with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I stand for you because you died for me. And so I'm going to live for you from this day on. You are my Lord, and so I surrender to you. You are my Savior who bought me, and so I'm going to live for you. And I worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand together and, and worship the Lord?